everyone for joining our Human Performance Webinars. My name is James Grigson. I'll be hosting today's panel. Yes, we're, we've changed up a little bit. Instead of looking at uh, best practices for athlete management systems, we'll be looking at best practices for athlete management, full stop. And managing our athletes post COVID-19 lockdown, return from isolation. And today we have a, a wonderful panel of, of, of guests ranging from the, the NBA, the Australian A-League soccer and the Australian rules football and looking at the challenges that they face because in a nutshell, despite while some sports are, are coming back at different times, uh, we're all facing that, that same challenge and that is bringing our athletes back. We saw some sport happen overnight here in Australia. We had a return of our rugby league. We've seen the Bundesliga German soccer go back over the last couple of weeks. The, the UFC went back. Uh, our, our world is starting to turn again. And that's why we wanted to bring these four gentlemen onto the panel to discuss that very challenge. Firstly, just wanted to acknowledge that there are still people and, and our friends overseas that are struggling with containing this pandemic. Um, and just our thoughts and prayers out to them. It's, it's, a, it's a terrible thing, once in a generation thing. And um, it's not something that we, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very challenging time for those nations. So just our thoughts out to, to those people. Um, ne nevertheless, I, I think the reason why we all get into to sports science and high performance is, is the challenge of how can we make our athletes the very best? How can we continue to optimize their performance? And how can we make sure that they maintain optimal? How can we ensure that they have a, a low risk of injury? And, and this, these new circumstances, these new variables have provided us with a, with a fresh set of challenges and the challenges that we, we want to get in today. So I just want to introduce our panel. Firstly, we have Dr. Simon Harris. He's the Senior Athletic Performance Specialist at the GWS Giants Australian Rules Football Club. Simon has been published multiple times uh, in and around exercise physiology. To set the scene for, for those that may not know, um, the Australian Rules Football League, they started one season game. So they did their full pre-season and then they had one season game back in March before the, the season was postponed. And they're looking to resume on June 11th. So Simon would have had his players back in um, for the last couple of weeks. So thank you for coming on, Simon. Thank you. Next, we have Elias Valkram. He's the head of high performance for the Sydney FC, so the Australian Soccer League or the A-League, as it's known. They played 20 games of their 29-game season before an interruption um, in late February. And it's looking like from the media, not confirmed yet, that um, July is the month that they will get back going. We also have uh, an international guest joining us, Jesse Green, despite the accent, he is over in California, Sacramento. He's the performance analyst for the Sacramento Kings NBA team. And they, they were about 60 games into their season before um, almost being the, the, the main domino that fell, that rocked the sporting world. Um, one of the first major leagues to, to postpone their season. And um, in March, and they still have about 20 to 30 games to play but that's TBD, um, as we all may know, still not yet determined to, to go back yet, the NBA. We're also joined by uh, a familiar face, Dr. Marcus Colby, joining, returning to the program again. Marcus is a smarter based consultant at Fusion Sport, but we've, we've brought him on not just for his good looks, but he has um, a number of publications in and around injury risk and prevention, specifically to Australian rules football. So hopefully he can bring um, some knowledge to the panel as well. So really want to get, get stuck in um, and launch some, into some questions. For, for those that are watching on Zoom, if you want to have your own questions um, into the panel, I'll be happy to be mediating and uh, popping these questions into the panel. You can use the chat functionality on the right-hand side of your screen or the bottom of your screen, whichever operating system you're on, and I'll be able to put them in within the, the chat or leave them towards the end of our Q&A. We should be going for about an hour here today. So plenty of time to get through all of our topics. And if you're on YouTube, post-production, post just pop in the comments below and, and we'll get discussing down there as well. So gents, uh, over the last couple of months, obviously you've had players remote, you've had players away from your facilities. What, can, you, can you go through um, how you were handling that training offsite, some of the, the, the practices that you put in place to handle that remote training? And what were some of the greatest challenges for you and your staff and, and how did you solve these? Simon, I actually might start with you, mate. Yeah, sure. Um, so I suppose how we handled it initially was that we just, when we saw that things were going to be 
stopping and we weren't going to be able to use our facility anymore. We, we really quickly dispersed all our equipment that we could to players. You know, we gave them in individualized packs that they could take and then also sent out to, I suppose, some, some central players who might live in certain areas of Sydney, some more equipment so they could, you know, have a little mini, little mini gym at their own home. Um, we paired the players together as best possible. So not sure exactly what in other parts of the world, but in Australia, you're still able to, to get outside and, and exercise in a park in pairs. So that was, that was excellent for us. Um, and then we just sent out really detailed programs to our players. Um, it was very similar to a typical off season period or, or maybe even the Christmas break is, is probably the best comparison where the expectation was they still were to train um, because you know, we knew that we could be coming back at any moment. So that was, that's what we did to try and handle it. Um, the biggest challenge was obviously equipment for strength training in, in some players cases that went, they went back to their homes, whether that was on a farm or, or somewhere else in Australia and they didn't have access. So we, we just had to adapt there. And, and the other challenge that we're, you know, we're finding out about at the moment is whether or not players self-selected to not perform, you know, some key components of the training programs. Um, in particular, what we want to focus on is our, our plyometrics and our, any running based technical drills and exposure to max velocity. So that's probably our biggest risk. Um, and and try, from a challenge perspective in, in player avoidance to programs, uh, but on the whole, they were really good, I think. And Simon, just to, to kind of follow up on that, um, just out of my interest from, from the AFL system, how did you go about the, the typical kind of prehab exercises that you'd uh, implement? Was there any change in, in how you prescribe those or um, like did you have to get creative, I guess, with how you could get those, um, those preventative exercises in? Um, well, I think if, you, if you're talking about prehab and I, um, I suppose those smaller injury prevention exercises that we might do, all of our players are on a, a reasonably individualised program anyway that doesn't require much equipment. They might just require a band, a mini band, you know, a roll, a trigger ball. They might not actually need that much. Um, so that was pretty well maintained, I think. Great. Jesse, how about you guys over there at the Kings? Yeah, so we sort of had, uh, when it all went down, we had some guys uh, remain in the market, so remain in Sacramento, and probably two-thirds of our list you know, left Sacramento to go home, as a lot of them don't actually reside here in Sac. So similar to what Simon was saying, for the guys who were remain here in Sacramento, we sort of dispersed our gym equipment as we could and as we needed to. Um, and then for the remaining guys, it was... Uh, uh, I guess it was a, it's a range depending on what sort of equipment they have available to them. We really have a, a plethora of a range. You know, some guys have their own courts in their house, their own gyms and the like, and other guys have next to nothing. So we really had to make sure that our core programming principles were sound and to make sure that, you know, whatever we needed, we had, you know, we could use the different tools available to each individual athlete, I guess, to, to make sure that that stimulus or whatever we were targeting on that day was, you know, was got. Um, so that being said, I think the guys have been doing a really good job in staying in game shape. I mean, basketballers, uh, especially in the NBA, just find a way to, to find a court and to hoop. Um, that's what they do. That's what they love. That's what they get paid the big bucks to do. So um, from an on-court perspective and a, you know, a sports-specific perspective, I think our guys have done a really good job uh, with staying in shape um, and then pushing out our programs through some... Um, you know, some online forums and chats and that sort of things has also been a useful tool for us as well. And uh, Jess, just on that front, I'm just going to keep firing the follow-up questions for, for good fun. Um, were, were there any, like, did you ever find players were using this as a, a different focus time, maybe doing other programs or training with other groups, uh, knowing that some NBA players can have external trainers come into the mix at, at varying off seasons? Was that was that a theme from your understanding in the NBA, or they were pretty content with the, the, just the standard program? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, it's it's I think it's part of the NBA these days, and part of the modern athlete that in the off season, some of them choose to go to, you know, their trainers who they might have been with since high school. You know, so if that's someone they know and who they trust, and 
they have access to a facility, well, we'd be a little remiss to, you know, pull them out of that environment. I think the best way to go about it is to collaborate with those, with those external trainers and sort of have a conversation about, you know, what's the best for this guy at this time. Um, so we've certainly been having those conversations and, you know, guys have been finding facilities and, and training with their respective trainers. So nonetheless, at the end of the day, as long as the, uh, as long as the athlete and the individual is getting what they need, it doesn't really matter if it's via, you know, our facility in our program or another facility in another program. Right. How about you, Elias? Um, yeah, I mean, our, our season was nearing its end, as you, as you mentioned earlier. Um, for us, the initial part was um, they were basically placed on leave. So they would take their leave in that period. So while they're on leave, we can't actually, uh, you know, enforce any type of work on them. It's completely optional. So we provided them with a program, once again, that was entirely optional. And we sort of wanted them to have a little bit of downtime, I think, because just you know, dealing with the uncertainty, dealing with you know, issues with pay and, you know, am I going to have a job? Is the season going to recommence? I think everybody deals with change a little bit, a little bit differently. So our biggest, uh, I guess, the first priority for us was just attending to their mental health and just making sure that everybody was okay with what was going on and checking in on the players. Once that, uh, that four to five week period had ended where it was no longer, um, they were no longer on leave, they were still, you know, placed on, on JobKeeper. So once again, we couldn't forcefully ask them to do anything. So it's, it, it was really difficult on that front. What we did do is just say to them, look, here's a GPS device. So we just got a bunch of, um, just I didn't want to give them our main devices. They're a little bit exy. So I just gave them some player tech devices. Um, and a heart rate monitor, and I said, here you go, our um, head of strength and conditioning, Chris Pappas, he basically wrote them a program which was periodized, which they could, could do, and we could monitor everything they could do. And I also um, gave them access to that program as well, because I guess it just, it just makes them slightly more accountable. And I think it's a little bit more exciting for them when they can see their heart rate response, when they can see how much work they've done. It gives, it's a little bit of motivation. They can compare their work against each other. So trying to find reasons to keep them motivated in a time of complete uncertainty, especially because there still, to this point, isn't a set date of return. So that's the biggest challenge for us. You made a really good um, point there, Elias, around kind of the mental well-being of, of players in this phase. And yeah, just curious, I guess, as a as a collective kind of on the on the ground experts, um, yeah, were there any kind of real focuses on that mental side and and how to maintain motivation, ensure they have resources? Uh, it would be great to get get some comments on that. Yeah, um, I guess uh, from from our side, it was just starting with communication and just checking in with everyone. Does anybody need anything? Um, keeping them in contact with each other as well. Uh, and then trying to set little goals or targets or give them, we, we sent them a whole bunch of, uh, about a list of things they could do in the time to keep themselves occupied. But yeah, even little challenges, you know, whether it's a 1K time trial or whether it's a, do you want to do a one-on-one -on -one session just to clear your headspace, get away from, you know, family for a little bit if you need a break and whatnot. So giving them an outlet if they need it. So we, as staff, made ourselves available um, for the one-on-one -on -one sessions when when that was still when that was still available. Now that they've opened it up, we've kind of had higher risk players come in a little bit more. Um, yeah, and once again, just making sure that they pick up the phone, give us a call if they feel they need an outlet. Right. Yeah, I think I'll play off that too, that, you know, that we're kind of lucky that the NBA and the NBA Players Association has, you know, they've put out a lot of resources in terms of the mental health side of things, in terms of consultants that they're able to call at any time of the day and all that sort of thing. But as you mentioned, Elias, I think it's trying to keep them connected with each other as well, which has been a big piece of what we've tried to push as well. Um, you know, it's really easy for guys who don't live in market to, you know, go back to their facility and, you know, not talk to anyone for an extended period of time. So having those uh, resources around us and, and trying to, I guess, um, increase that player participation between each other has been, you know, certainly priority for us. Yeah, that's clearly been the same with the AFL and, and our club in particular. They've, we've had weekly Zoom chats with the entire group um, and they've also had them broken off into smaller groups that have their own additional meetings on 
whether that was actually about the, you know, what they're doing training wise or just mental health. Um, and then they've had their access to our sports psych and our welfare managers. It's really had so much, so many resources pushed their way um, for them to reach out if they needed to. And, and likewise to what Elias said, you know, they were also pushed towards doing things in the break. You know, there was a lot of um, resources sent to open education courses that they might be interested in and different things that would keep them occupied during uh, quite a different period of their life. And as the players begin to return to your training facilities, um, Simon, obviously you're, you're experiencing that a little bit now and, and you've all, you know, Jesse and Lars have touched on how you're doing it uh, in a remote setting. But um, as they begin to return, is, is there any sort of important technologies or, or methods or tools that you'll be looking to implement to assess your players? And, and more specifically, do, how do these um, indicators from a physical or even cognitive perspective maybe differ from your general pre-season or um, in-season indicators, if at all? I think, um, I think in the AFL's context, as you said, we, we finished our pre-season and we started one game. So I think front of our mind was they'd had 17 weeks of training before we went into isolation. And then in eight weeks of isolation, you know, we, as I said, we continued to train. We did a, a month of a, a real volume or accumulation type period where we backed off the intensity, but, you know, maintained preseason volumes. And then the final four weeks, we really intensified the, the training program to, to have closer demands to what they're going to do when they come back to us. Um, so you, they've got 25 weeks of training behind them as they step back into the doors. So for us, really, we, we didn't have the time and we couldn't, you know, it's very hard to justify a standardized fitness test on return. So the, what, what we did was indirect assessment. And so we're looking at what intensities are the players training at during football drills, where we know, what the normative reference values are for, for each player or, or positional groups and what they should be outputting in that drill. You know, common, you know, no brainers. We're looking at the visual signs, you know, what's their body language like during the session? Are they dropping off throughout the session? You know, how do they recover? Um, we're looking at some of their heart rate data whilst some, we do some off legs tra training, you know, on the bike or, or other. And then really importantly, we're having, detailed conversations with them you know and that that's that's primarily how we approach it at this point and how did your program go what did you do what couldn't you do what were your biggest challenges etc um and so we really I, I think you know my main point on this and i've seen a lot in social media in the last few days is around ramping up training and i think the side of the coin that's been missed is you know you've got to have some trust in your players that they've done the program, you know, as Jesse said, the guys in the NBA are getting paid huge money. The AFL guys get paid pretty well. Also, you know, it's their job to turn up in shape, knowing that we're going to get back into football training and they knew that they'd be playing within three to four weeks. So there's an enormous trust on the players here. Yeah, I think Simon, you, you kind of nailed it there. I mean, I think the AFL and, the NRL, you know, they're a couple of weeks ahead of us in terms of returning to the facility. I mean, we haven't uh, mandated any sort of return uh, just yet, uh, but we assume it's probably coming shortly in the next, you know, two, three weeks or so. But I guess, James, to answer your question in terms of the tech and all that sort of stuff, it absolutely plays a role. And we want to be objective in terms of what they were before they left, given that we were, you know, two thirds through the way of our season. So we can compare to those numbers. But again, Simon, you nailed it in the sense that you know, how are these guys feeling when they get back and we start doing some scrimmages, some game-like drills, and we can match up the objective values to game values and practice values and all these things as well. But, you know, it's, it's all well and good if those metrics align and it's great to tick that box. But, you know, if they're really struggling through that, then that's probably something we need to address. And conversely, if they're feeling great, well, that's a, a great sign to progress. Um, yeah, on that, I agree with both the lads. 
um, you're coming back into a period where it's 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 accelerated. It's accelerated training, um, and you're just basically trying to do everything you can to prepare for games. So one of the big things for me, and I'm sure for the boys as well, is you never want to apply testing at the expense of quality training, and that's the most important thing. So if you've got a, if you whether it's a yo-yo or a beep test or whatever the hell you're doing on pitch, whether it's repeated sprint efforts. You don't want to perform those testing procedures at the expense of quality training. And, and you really have to turn around and ask yourself, why am I actually testing in the first place? So unless you can answer that question, um, then you're just collecting data for the sake of it. And that's one of the most important things. And I think we're all guilty of it. We can occasionally just throw out a test and then collect data and actually not use that data. So one of the big things for us is knowing that the talk now is that we've got a four week uh, period to prepare for uh, a an additional four week period where we've got potentially eight games to play. So for us, it comes down to not testing, but rather just making sure that our programming is correct. Um, probably the one thing I would say, and similar to what Simon was alluding to, whilst we're not doing, we probably won't have many standalone on field tests. What we'll do is we'll use um, our drill profiling to look at to look at their their output in a particular drill and then match that with their RPE and heart rate. So how are you responding? How much time have you actually spent in you know in your red zone? How much you know, what's your RPE for a given drill? And what was it previously? So this was your output before you broke away. This is your output today. Your response to that output, both at the time and also the days following, and that comes through the communication and wellness questionnaires and whatnot. How how is it perceived? And if it's perceived as though, wow, that was actually significantly more intense than what it was pre-breakaway, then we know that these players are deconditioned. And I mean, that's obvious, but it at least allows you to periodize and actually get some, some hard data week to week without necessarily doing some standalone testing. So if you're repeating a drill week to week and you're periodizing it and you're finding the RPE to that, uh, I guess the, the perceived exertion for that drill is less and your heart rate response is better, including the recovery curve, then you know that your players, are, I guess, they're improving. Um, probably the one other thing I'll add to that is we do, we will do some off-field testing, and that's mostly things that are not going to interfere with their ability to train. So it might be something like uh, we just want to have a look at their, you know, how far off they are with their CMJ, so we'll use a jump mat for that. Um, we'll do some uh, like reactive strength index testing, some single leg triple hop, and just get a gauge of that. We want to know, I guess, the amount that they've <laughs> the amount of decrement since since going away, but also then be able to turn around to the coaching staff and say, okay, this particular athlete is probably not done much in the time in time off and may represent a greater risk upon returning to you know a game every three days. I kind of had just one, I guess, follow up for for the group as well. I guess in terms of um, uh, preparing the players to perform as a group, I think they've they've all gone away to train and keep that physical fitness. But I guess gelling as a group again, uh, more from a performance standpoint, will you look to kind of implement any strategies early? Um, to I know we have like preseason camps that can be around bonding and, and getting the group back together. Um, but just wondering if there's any considerations on um, building that, that, that camaraderie, I guess, uh, within the group. That's a big challenge. Um, we're constrained, though, at the moment that our players, for the first week when we came back, could only train in, in groups of 10 or less. And so what we had to do there, we had to factor in, well, it was actually eight players plus a coach and plus a performance staff member. So that, that made up your group of 10. So we had to split our group into six groups. And from a staff perspective, it was basically Groundhog Day where we repeated the same day six times in that day. Um, thankfully, as of this week, we're allowed two sessions a week where they can be together as a group. But they can only be together as that group on field for that one you know, football session. Once they come back indoors and go into their strength, strength groups, their... Their, um, you know, positional specific skill rotations in the afternoon, they have to go back in those small groups. Um, so there's definitely going to be no camp um, and it's very challenging to, to get them all together. But so those weekly Zoom meetings, um, they still occur. And so they still get online 
um, to have those meetings together. Great. Yeah, I think that's a big part as well of what the coach instills too. Like how does the head coach usually tackle, you know, that camaraderie piece? You know, I mean, we're very fortunate, or I guess I'm very fortunate that our coach here, he's a, you know, he's very big on that sort of family feel and family piece of it. So, I mean, time will tell how that looks on the front end in terms of what will be delivered to the players, but there's no doubt there will be within the constraints that we have, of course, you know, that, I guess, bonding or camaraderie building, whatever you want to call it. But that's certainly a big piece when you spend, you know, every day with each other for six months of the year. Uh, yes. <laughs> I, mean, I think our guys just want to play Call of Duty. <laughs> that's about it. That's all I mean. They just want to play video games. That's the way they get together from a distance as well. Yeah, but you're right. Like Simon was saying, it's going to be difficult in these times because we're, we're virtually being asked wherever possible to stay away from each other. So do I, I guess it's the whole get in, get out type philosophy that they're applying now. It's just do what you need to do and then get the hell out of there. Don't eat together. Don't do this together. I'm challenging that a little bit. Um, we had a meeting with uh, all the leagues a couple of days ago in the FFA governing body. I mean, there were some recommendations that you don't eat on sites. And, and, and you know, a big, big part of what we do at Sydney is post-training. We actually all eat together. We have lunch together. We, you know, it's, a, it's just a big part of what we do. Um, you know, there's no, t no phones on tables, just a little bit of discussion time. So to take that away from us, I think our gaffer is probably not particularly fond of that. Um, and he's, he's actually asked me specifically to try and make sure that the, <laughs> that the leagues don't take that away from them in the medical policy. And I said to him, look, the, 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 you know, if you want the honest truth, they're probably just going to go to a cafe anyway. So if you're talking about risk mitigation, you're better off having a chef cooking for them in a controlled hygienic environment than you are them going to a cafe where they're going to potentially be exposed to more illness. For sure. And I guess, yeah, definitely reiterate the, the, the Zoom catch-ups and um, even working with Infusion and kind of the strategies that we looked at early on in terms of keeping our consultant teams, our various regions connected. Um, yeah, the, the Zoom catch-ups, having your webcam on, seeing someone's face, seeing a smile and expression um, has been really, I think, helpful for our, our team bonding. Um, so that's been a uh, uh, fun kind of thing around happy hours and Hawaiian shirt Fridays, you name it. So uh, <laughs> just to mix it up. But uh, yeah, no, really interesting thought. Thanks. Yeah, he's been pulling out some rippers, uh, old, old Colby, with the Hawaiian <laughs> shirts. Uh, as we begin to move along the journey, you know, and Simon touched on it briefly, um, really keen to understand the approach to periodization with, with, with the given training period that you have. And, you know, for someone like Elias looking at eight games in, in three weeks and Simon, you know, you guys are getting some pretty ridiculous turnarounds in, in comparison to what you would normally have. How are you guys going to approach that periodization? It seems, Simon, from your perspective that, you know, there's a, there, obviously there's a fair bit of trust in your players that they've maintained that load that they had, um, obviously, prior to the, the isolation. Um, I might throw it to you, mate. How, how are you looking to approach that periodization when, uh, well, you guys are now, you're back in, back in training? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, as I said, there's an expectation that they've, in the previous four weeks, they had a really intense training block. Having said that, we do have to be we're sensible. Um, so what we've done is a really gradual, I suppose, linear build in five key areas of how we look at the intensity of training. And so that's football drill intensity. So, you know, I, for example, it was more discrete and non-competitive skill um, drills in training sessions last week. And that will gradually shift in time to more competitive games and drills and towards, you know, I suppose, match simulation. Um, there's a gradual increase in the sustained intensity of our drills. So, you know, how long are they spending working at high intensities? Whether that's just constant movements and meters per minute, or is that also involving, you know, a speed component to those drills? Um, thirdly, the amount of change directional mechanical load, you know, that accelerometer based kind of load in multi directions and how much, and because we do know what our drills elicit, how much do we actually give the players as we progress and getting that gradual increasing? And then fourthly and finally, a progressive exposure to max velocity. So in the first week, we, you know, we're not asking our players to, to run above 90% of their max velocity, but 
we're building towards that. And most definitely this week, they're running at those intensities. And how are you looking at tackling it, uh, Elias? Um, yeah, very similar to what Simon says. One of the biggest risks for us in, in the initial weeks upon, upon return is obviously we're trying to minimise the risk to the knees. So one of the biggest things we find is neuromuscular activation is compromised, right? So they've been out for eight weeks, their timing is off. So similar to Simon, you know, you're minimizing the intensity of the change of direction drills and you're really uh, limiting, I guess, your velocity. It's just about progressively introducing velocity. And, and yeah, first week, definitely you're keeping them sub-maximal. Um, for us, the bet, we, we, take, we use a tactical periodization model. So essentially a large part of our periodization is based around football drills. And we dictate speeds and change of direction and intensity, um, largely based on uh, we're, we're modifying the area of the drill, the number of people within that drill, um, the amount of rest given, I guess, between, between sets and um, how long they're performing the drill. And a lot of that actually just helps us to periodize. So, you know, obviously we, we won't start off with small areas because small areas involve sharper change of direction, right? So we'll start off with like a medium area drill as opposed to large area where they're doing larger area, they're gonna get higher velocity. So we wanna control velocity. We wanna control change of direction, it's simple. We just go, okay, coaches wanna do a drill. Our advice to coaching staff is let's start with medium area drills where you can control the intensity of actions and you can control the velocity. So the biggest thing for us is trying to periodize using football drills. And we've always done that. And I think football is, is probably biased towards that because we are there to accommodate the coaching staff. We are there to just facilitate what they want to achieve. And then, you know, obviously there will be some standalone work where we're you know, increasing velocity, increasing your, you know, your typical variables, um, you know, your high speed, high speed meters and whatnot. But for us, it is largely, once again, tactical periodization. How do I overload a small area this week? Um, last week, I didn't overload it. You know, typically you would perform X in a game. We are going to perform Y. So we're going to underload you, but this week we're going to overload you. And then obviously into the week leading into the season commencing, trying to have a little bit of a taper period there. But, you know, all that said, we've basically got three weeks to periodize. So you tell me how you periodize in three weeks. <laughs> how about you guys, Jesse? Yeah, I think, I mean, even though the, the sports, are, I guess our sports are quite different in the sense it's court-based and a small game and field-based sports, I mean, the, the principles of progression and periodization remain the same, you know. You've got to know as best as you can the end goal, I guess, for example. So, I mean, we don't really know what our schedule is going to look like yet, but having a really good understanding of, okay, what are those demands going to be? Is the game going to be shortened? Is the rest between games going to be shortened? What's their weekly what is their rolling loads going to look like? Um, where are they at right now? And then from there, it's, a, I guess, a simple gap analysis. And, you know, as Elias said, that we're sort of in a congested period uh, here. So in terms of trying to periodize three weeks, well, it's, uh, it's not going to be too much, um, too, or too complex, I guess. You've got to try and keep that part simple. But from that point on, you know, it's for us, very, very similar to what Simon was saying is, you know, it's the volume, intensity, frequency, and contact are those four pillars of, of programming that we really take into account, you know, starting with, uh, I guess, non-contact drills. We're not going into full scrimmage straight away. And we might start with larger spaces because I think, Elias, you mentioned it, mate, that, you know, those smaller drills have a very high mechanical load. You know, it's, we like to break our drills up into intensive and extensive drills where, you know, you have your intensive drills, it's a very small spaces, half court in the key type drills, which, you know, lots of uh, mechanical load, change direction. It's, you know, I like to, liken it, I guess, to, you know, highway driving versus city driving, you know, city driving, there's a lot of stopping, starting, turning corners, that sort of stuff, which is going to fatigue or it's going to put a tax on your car in one way, whereas there's highway driving, which is much faster speeds, less change of direction, but there is a fatigue and there is a cost associated with that as well. So being able to periodize those intensive versus extensive drills and layering in the contact over the time that you have and the gap that you've analyzed is you know, is how we're going to try and tackle it. And until we know what that end goal is, I can't really give you much more of an answer than that. No, that's great. I guess uh, some follow-up kind of thoughts or, or questions um, for the group as well would be kind of around uh, the, the response, I guess, to the, the phase that you're uh, returning in. So whether that's using any type of objective screening tools, um, 
Simon made the great point of yeah having that human first approach and, and conversations and seeing how they're they're feeling uh, but I guess from more of an objective standpoint are there kind of variables or technologies um, that you'll use to kind of help I guess put put the brakes on potentially or or ramp up your program on any given day Sure, I'll jump in there. Um, absolutely. So, as I said, we use our GPS data to to inform, you know, our intensities of training. But in a response to that, we're looking at the perceptual wellness that the players report. Um, we look at some neuromuscular fatigue markers during a, a weekly routine counter movement jump on force plates, and then we also have some screening tests to look at more of the acute fatigue um, we, we do some groin squeeze tests as tests at different positions um, so those are our kind of three pillars of our monitoring system um, and then to as you said the human element is super important so we kind of take an approach we've got this collaborative coaching eye and the experience of, of not just our athletic um, development staff but our medical staff and really importantly football coaches so they have a, a really big input in I suppose getting the feel of each player and the group as a whole and where they're at. Great. And, and, and is that mainly through say an RPE, Simon, or is it just a, again, just a discussion like a, a coach RPE or would you just be having a discussion on? No, it, it's training? more of a, a discussion. Um, so <clears throat> at GWS, you know, one thing that I've noticed since I started working here is, is how thorough the coaching staff are reviewing every single training session. So before they walk off the, off the pitch as a group of the six to seven coaches, they stand around a circle and review everything they did in that training session. And they might go for 20 minutes sometimes. Um, so that they get a really good immediate, immediately post session feel for that session. Um, and then also they, they do a really good job of planning sessions in advance and collaboratively doing that, um, where they all get a, a chance to input in what's going to happen in the next session. Um, so that I suppose there's the two kind of feedback loops there um, and inputs where they can adjust really dynamically to what they think the players need and how they think the players are going in response to what we've been doing. Great. Jess, how about yourself? Yeah, objectively, we tend to lean on our counter movement jump data uh, quite a lot. We tend to do that quite frequently, you know, two to three times per week in season. Um, we really like the test. Uh, we have great data set on that and credit to our staff who roll that out um, for getting really tight markers on that. So we tend to rely on that. But, you know, as you said, Colbs, like when, when do we put on the brakes, if at all? I mean, if it's a two week build or a three week build, whatever we end up with, well, we've got to have a decision as a staff you know, if we do see some markers drop, are we just going to have to reach and keep going? You know, I mean, at what cost are we going to have to put the brakes on? Because we might be doing the players a disservice by putting on the brakes if we're, you know, we just have a short time to prepare and we sort of have to train through this, you know, initial phase of the return to the games. So once we have that endpoint in mind, we'll, we'll make that decision. But along with that counter movement jump data, I guess, subjectively, um, our medical practitioners that have, a lot of NBA experience between them. And, um, you know, they tend to put their hands on our guys every single day. And from a soft tissue standpoint, they tend to record in quite a bit of depth how they respond to that training. Um, we sort of run a model where each practitioner has four to five players that they work with um, exclusively across the season. So they get a very good idea of, you know, from a soft tissue standpoint, how these guys respond to different loads. And then I guess the last piece objectively is standardized training drills and standardized um, scrimmages, how are those uh, intensities progressing or regressing, I guess, throughout those builds too. Are they approaching game intensities or are they pulling further away from game intensities in situations where we would expect them to be able to reach those levels? That's great. Um, yeah, I'll just add to that. So, I think, as the boys alluded to, their good program is, is is key. You know, you don't you you hope that the good programming eliminates the need to either slow down or ramp up your training sessions. But yeah, 
a lot of the times you're going to have to adapt um, based on how players respond. Now, the boring answer is obviously communication and wellness flags are probably your, your most valuable tools. Uh, players will tell you, especially senior players, they'll tell you when they feel tired. And um, and probably one of the other subjective measures, non-objective, I guess, is just getting a visual on the players in training. So just looking at movement quality, looking at... Um, you know, signs of any cognitive de decline. Are they making more errors than they normally would? So they are subjective, but just in terms of objective, we have a, um, we use a, a, a smarter based dashboard um, and it's a multivariate analysis dashboard where we just basically take a whole bunch of data we think is indicative of potential injury risk, or I guess the boys are doing too much. Um, and, and that gives us a score out of, I think about 13. We just made it up, it's arbitrary. Um, but some of the some of the data that goes into that. So we'll do a weekly um, reactive strength index test. Um, so it's drop off a box, single leg, triple hop, and we're taking best score. And we're doing that left and right. Um, I like that test in particular because I think it's got a stability component. It's it's unilateral as well. So it'll pick up a deficit on one side. I guess my my thing with the counter movement jump, while I like it, and it's a it certainly biases a power. I just don't know if and, and I could be wrong here, the boys can tell me otherwise. I'm just not certain that week-to-week -week, um, discrepancies are, are visible enough. I, I mean, I'll, I'll lean on you guys for that. I certainly found with the reactive strength index, a single leg triple hop, it'll pick up a deficit. If you've got something wrong with your ankle, your foot, your knee, your hip, or there is some reason you cannot produce power at that time, it'll pick it up. So I'll, I'll use that as one. Um, and then we have we have uh, threshold lines for every single one of our players, and that threshold line is based on the maximum amount they performed in a single session or game. So a perfect example is let's say game day data, most amount all season you've ever performed in a single day is a thousand high speed meters. Just throwing a number out there, and I've got a threshold line. If you exceed that threshold line for the first time in four weeks, there's every chance that you're going to respond to that. You're going to get an actual response to that. You're going to feel pain. You're going to get soreness or whatever it is. So we do it. We do have a flag based on threshold um, response, and it works both ways. So if you're not actually hitting that threshold, or you're not getting within, you know, ninety percent of that threshold, and you haven't done so in a, in, in a few weeks then you're probably going to have a deconditioning effect. So there's there's that, but then there's also, you know, your typical, and, and take this with a grain of salt, you know, you, we use an exponentially weighted uh, model to, to look at acute chronic loading. But um, like I said, we're not, we throw that in the mixer and it's certainly not something we rely heavily on, but it's just one of those, you know, one of those other markers for yeah, our multivariate dashboard. That's great. Treat a few people there alas with that with that comment, but we won't go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. Any uh, so so future considerations for for your squad. So um, firstly, actually, what what we'll do is uh, I wanted to look at future considerations, but there's there's a question that's come in via Zoom back to um, back to the conversation before around you know distancing communication using technology, whether it be get on a a Call of Duty um, game together and still be able to have that share that camaraderie, you know, digitally. Um, how do you think that shaped your operation so far? And do you think that, you know, do you see that what has happened during this lockdown will change the way that your team communicates for future seasons? I think it will in, in our case. I think um, some of the things we've used so far zoom and and videoing some of our training drills and sending them out to players i think that's going to continue through future off seasons um, and breaks uh, i wouldn't be surprised if if uh, i suppose a little bit more independence is placed on the players throughout the pre-season period particularly those senior players Yeah, for sure. I, I tend to agree with you, Simon, in the sense that, you know, it's this period has sort of made us, you know, it's almost forced us to be a little bit more efficient in what we communicate and how we communicate it. You know, it's could a, you know, could an email be a simple text or could a Zoom call be a text or could an email be, you know, redundant? You know, I think it's forced us to be a little bit more efficient when we're forced to be. So I, I think no doubt it's going to change how we communicate going forward. 
Yeah, as much as I hate to admit it, it will. I'm, I'm somebody that likes to communicate in person. I'm not a big fan of... Um, I've, I've tried to round, my, uh, round the troops up a few times at our training base and the guys have gone, oh, is it okay if we just zoom in? So I think if you're getting that response, you're definitely getting, uh, you know, change in mentality and you get that from players as well. Yeah, but I'm a little bit old school. I really like to do things in person. Uh, I don't know, maybe I like looking at people's body language. I like, um, I think, yeah, I think you lose a form of communication via, via Zoom. Um, and that's, yeah, um, I guess... Oh, that's just that's just my point of view. But you're right; it's going to change. I mean, and you, you know it's changing because you can just see the number of people adopting Microsoft Teams. They're looking at Slack. They, you know, people are using WhatsApp and all these you know stay at home you know, stay at home tools. And a lot of you look at commercial real estate at the moment; it's it's horrible. You know, the people can't people can't get into buildings, so they're just working from home. You got twenty thousand people that need to go into a building and share three lifts. It'll take you ten hours to get everybody in there. So yeah, no doubt it's going to change. It's a really good point, Elias, and I'm I'm definitely with you on the the human part. Like I love being around people, friends, colleagues, whatever it may be. But I think a, another really interesting um, point you brought up there would be kind of around the format that we communicate. Will we continue to have these video calls? Will will we back down to just text messages again, or can we still bring that kind of human element of seeing a face and uh, not just having a, a group WhatsApp or something? Um, so we're really curious on the technology front, what gets developed to continue that, um, or if we can maintain uh, just knowing that this this uh, pandemic can ebb and flow potentially. Um, so yeah, really, really interesting stuff. Just wanted to thank uh, Hamish Ashton for that question. Didn't give him a shout out before before asking that. So thank you for that. And, and please begin to put through your questions as we um, come towards the, the top of the hour here and, and concluding our, our panel. One, one final question for me that I'm really interested in is, is how are you guys going to be, you know, we spoke a little bit about, about your approach to periodization and training, but I'm really interested in the thoughts from the panel about you know, almost, almost maintaining this load and you're, as much as we can't, we don't all have a, a crystal ball and we all can't see what's going to happen four weeks once the season go back or eight weeks once the season goes back. But especially obviously Simon, you're going to be dealing with this for, for a longer period of time, given you have to go through a whole season compared to the others on the call. But how, how, how do you, what are some of your approaches and, and thought processes and, and concepts around potentially managing some of the issues that may come up from that shorter, sure. that shorter period um, ramp and then, and then getting back into the full swing of things? Yeah, well, I think of what Jesse mentioned before is with a short, period having the players face to face before training before we play you you've got to take the plunge a little bit and if you back off too much you you're actually probably putting them at a greater risk once the games return so i 100 percent agree with jesse that sometimes you just got to move on and just you know take that little bit of risk that you know is there knowing that that might outweigh the greater risk once you get into games um, so moving forward through the rest of the season, I suppose the biggest factor for us is the players will have had 29 weeks of preparation before we start playing. When you factor in when they return to training back in end of November. So I don't think uh, for any AFL team, they'll be using fitness as an excuse once the season recommences. I think what they, and we will be you know most concerned about is the, the psychological fatigue that might be accumulating as the season goes on. Um, you know, if you're thinking that they're going to have reduced recovery between matches there, we're very isolated from friends and family at the moment. So we've actually had to agree to a range of very strict isolation protocols to allow training and games to, to commence. So essentially, you know, without going into detail, I'm essentially allowed to go to work and come home and I'm not allowed any visitors in my home. I'm, you know, I can, I can really only go to essential services and all the players are under those same things. So, so they're very isolated and you know, they're young guys and they want to be around people. So that's, that's massive for them. There's going to be probably 10 guys out of 45 that are really worried about their career certainty. There's a lot of talk about the reduction in list sizes. Um, and then, you know, the environment, just how it is working at the moment is super stressful. So our biggest challenge is, is keeping a close eye on those psychological factors. So, 
we're probably taking the approach of trying to make our environment as as fun and enjoyable as possible because when they're at the club that's essentially their only interaction human interaction at the moment so we need to make sure that that's you know hitting what they need from a psychological perspective as well as the physical because they're not getting it anywhere else so that's probably our biggest part and it's at the front of our mind for the rest of the season yeah for sure and i don't think it's probably talked about enough you know like some of the uh i guess the return to game plan or the formats that the nba have proposed is you know a two-week camp on a, a sort of a hub type setup and then games from there which could you know, it could lead to about a month away from home, wherever home might be for some of these guys. So, you know, you, you factor in obviously the physical component being a, a fast ramp, but I mean, you go from spending a lot of time at home with, you know, obviously loved ones and, and family, and then you go straight into a period where you don't see them for a month. That can be pretty, uh, pretty significant from a, you know, psychological uh, fatigue standpoint as well. But um, on back onto the physical side of things too, I mean, it's, I think the research is out there to support enough that, you know, the longer time you spend building something, the more residual effects you will have from that. And then it's sort of that balance, you know, between win now and forsake a little bit of chronic load or a bit of fitness in the bank versus train through it, build a little bit more at the cost of maybe a higher fatigue during those early games. And again, I wish I could give you a, a better answer in relation to our actual schedule, but we just don't have it yet. But yeah, that's sort of my thoughts on that. Um, yeah, look, I mean, we're, the one thing I will say is this, it's not foreign to us to play games every three days. Um, uh, it's, you know, it's actually probably not a bad thing that we're playing them all in Oz. And there are times where we have to back up three days later following a trip to China and back or Japan and back. And so, you know, a, a lot of what we're going to do now is just recovery. I think the biggest challenge we're going to face is... Um, you have players who don't get minutes and the players who don't get minutes, they're going to slowly decondition unless you top them up. The biggest problem is you, you're in a situation, you're in a constant, you know, this vicious cycle of, I've got these players that I, the coaching staff want to be able to have on the bench to use, um, but they haven't done any work. So we play on a Wednesday, we've got a game on Saturday, for example, I want to top you up. If I top you up on Thursday, then it's likely that's going to feed into Saturday's game. And if the coaching staff need to use you for Saturday's game and you're not fresh because we've actually given you a stimulus on the Thursday, then, you know, we're the bad guys. So you're in this constant cycle of trying to keep these guys who don't get match minutes fit. And that's probably one of the greatest challenges of, of this period, I think. I think it's, it's, I say easy, it's easy enough to be able to say, hey, I've identified these are our high-risk players, you know, older athletes who may not be able to back up every three days. And there will be those athletes who can't. You know, if you've got a 36-year-old who, who who plays 90 minutes, you know, that, that guy's generally, if it, they're in a position which is you know, has a high mechanical load, they're probably not going to back up three days later. But I think we're experienced enough with our medical team and we've had enough time with our players to be able to determine who those are. And and t to be honest, our coaching staff can help with that as well because they're, they're amazing, you know, don't take anything away from them. They can virtually tell you who they know can back up and who can't. But yeah, biggest challenge for us is trying to keep the guys who don't get match minutes fit because the moment a coach asks for that player and he turns around, he goes, I'm F because the boys topped me up on Thursday. Um, he's going to turn around. He's going to look at the medical staff. What in God's name are you doing? But then when that player comes on and they can't perform because they haven't had any training, you, you know, it's a double-edged sword. Sure. Yeah, really appreciate that that uh, insight, gents. We have a, a question here from Cameron Ross from New Zealand. Uh, Cameron asks, thanks for the discussion. Great to hear from you all. With the lack on contact tackling drills, is there a concern of a decrease in skill or fitness within tackling? And is there anything that you're implementing to mitigate the risk of injury, if any? The, the, the contact, it, um, obviously, tackling would be within Simon's world of AFL, but obviously there is tackling um, and contact in, in both the other sports. I'm really interested to hear how, um, you know, both basketball and, and soccer feel about this this topic as well. Simon? Yeah, sure. So as part of the final four weeks of the isolation period, what we did do is we introduced a lot more up and down off the ground work and rolling in some of our conditioning. So 
So players have to hit the ground, roll over the shoulder, get up and go, you know, for example. So just trying to maintain some body impacts on the upper extremities. And then since returning, we just had, once we've been able to, which was at the start of this week, we just really progressively increased the contact drills that we're, we're performing. You know, we haven't gone to you know, live tackling drills as yet. Um, so most definitely there, there's going to be a risk associated with not having that you know, longer exposure to, to contact. Um, so we're doing our best to, to build them up. Um, and yeah, well, you know, I don't think that there's, Aside from what we're doing, I'm not sure that there's any other way to, to reduce that risk. I think they're going to be sore the first couple of games. There, there's going to be a lot of a lot of shock to the system from that contact. Yeah, same for sure. I mean, inherently contact-based drills and contact in general is you know, it's high exposure to an injurious situation. So inherently there's a higher risk. And I mean, just like with everything we've talked about so far, it's just a, a logical progression and periodization of that contact. And, you know, it's, it comes down a little bit to your monitoring too, to see how they're, I guess, how they're uh, responding to that too. But I guess an example that we would use, because we talk about contact quite a lot is that, you know, you want to start with a smaller space as you can, I guess, one-on-one, -on -one, for example, because the contact is expected, you know, where it's coming from. Um, and also it's very low velocity. Um, and also, I guess that being said, once you progress from that is in basketball specifically, I'll speak to my environment, but you know, there's such a wide range in terms of the contact that can be experienced by a player. You know, you have a center who, you know, his game might completely sit on being a rough, you know, clang and bang type center player. Whereas you have other point guards who, you know, might not get near contact for four games in a row. So you know, you really have a wide range of contact and I guess taking into account knowing your players and knowing the game style your coach wants to implement, that's almost going to drive your strategy and drive your periodization a little bit there. I'll just jump in here. We've, um, we've been asked to try and have a phase one, phase two implementation strategy where, you know, small groups, non-contact, then eventually adding contact. I've kind of put my hand up and said, I just don't think we can afford to do that in, with such uh, a short amount of time to prepare for the season and that we should be able to um, design training drills based on no restrictions. Um, I mean, you think about the NRL and whatnot, they, a lot of sport has already kicked off in Australia. So whilst I appreciate what they're trying to do with it, I think it elevates risk. And, and the biggest thing for us is when you, when you take out contact, you take out agility. So agility, is, agility only exists because you're responding to a stimulus. And you can't respond to a stimulus if you know that person cannot make contact with you. So if you're trying to avoid a player, and if one of our guys has the ball and they're trying to get around the player, and they know that a player can't tackle them, there's no agility component to it, right? There's change of direction, there's no agility. So, and, and one of the things we know is that if you're not training agility, then your risk of non-contact injuries is elevated, especially um, ligament related injuries. So for us, it's the big, big thing is being able to go, I don't want this phase one, phase two. I want to be able to introduce contact when I deem it fit. Um, and that might be after five days, could be after seven days, it could be after, you know, 15 days, just whenever we deem it fit, not because there's been a random phase one, phase two rollout. We're getting to, to the, towards the end of the top of the hour. We will, um, we have someone actually who's just raised their hand. So that, that means that they're actually able to talk. So I think um, this actually might be a good one, or maybe they didn't mean to press that button because they've just, taking their hand down. So we will wrap up there. If you have any questions that weren't answered, I, I do see a couple of outstanding. Please do pop in um, an email to me, james at fusionsport.com. Uh, and we'll look to um, push them through to the panelists and, and get some of their thoughts. Please join us next week on our webinar with the, the Denver Nuggets. That's happening mid that's happening mid week next week. Uh, times will be emailed out to you if they already have not. I don't want to butcher the uh, US and Australia time zone conversion. So I'll, I'll just leave, leave it to, um, please, please make sure that you check those, um, those emails that we send through. And we really look forward to the webinar next week with, with the Denver Nuggets. To everyone here on the panel, thank you so much for joining us. It was a fantastic discussion. Thank you, Jesse, Elias, Simon, really appreciate it. Best of luck with your, your mini pre-seasons and your ramps and, and for the, the NBA and the A-League finishing your season. 
um, and for, for the AFL completing a season. Best of luck and thank you very much for joining us.